Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm just so glad that I'm here with you guys, and my wife is, you know, she doesn't always get the chance to come along with me, but this is one occasion she's with me. So would you mind standing up, my dear wife? This is Ingrid. We've been married for 35 years. Amen. And uh, have done many things, everything, ev everything, actually, you know, that's we have done, we've done as a team. And uh, so she can't always come to every place that we have been, but uh, she certainly got me there to those various different places. And uh, so this past year, actually, I should maybe give you a little bit of an update, you know, because it's been a while since I've been here, I believe. So, you know, we, we transitioned back in 2016 where uh, Pastor Joel and Jamie took over the church from us, and they're busy bringing it to a much higher level than we would be able ever to bring it because we're good starters, but we need people that can take things to a higher level. Amen. So I believe that's always very important. Joel's a really good mentor. I've been more of a tormentor. So, <laughs> so you have to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Amen. <laughs> and uh, so, but, you know, that gives us the opportunity to travel more. And so we've been in so many different places since 2016. Uh, every continent we've been on now, except for Ant Antarctica, <laughs> that's the only continent we've not been. But everywhere else we have been and uh, been involved in, not just, we don't want to just go and bring the word, but we want to bring the word and the spirit and build something with other people as well. So we've got great vision. You know, we got a 2020 vision uh, in which we are uh, implementing some of the things that the Lord has laid on our heart that has to do with uh, planting and launching more churches, more uh, leadership centers. Amen. You might call them Bible schools, but I would like to get away from the word Bible school. Not that it's a wrong word, but, you know, people don't flock, it seems, to Bible schools, but they love leadership training centers. Amen. So uh, a leadership training center is a place where you get fed the Bible. And so we've done it in various places on a small scale where not only ministry leaders come, but business, leader come, business leaders come. Because some of you know, uh, everybody in, is in need of good leadership training that involves high morals, high ethics, and some really good Bible principles that include giving and receiving. Amen. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've even got some politicians coming to some of the places that we went. And so we are really excited about that. And so our 2020 vision really involves we want to build 20 more centers like that, ministry units that includes a church, uh, a leadership training center, but then something on the humanitarian side as well, like a humanitarian project. Now, of course, that will look different from place to place. In Canada, we'd, we'd like to see more youth and children uh, projects taking place because we need to reach our next generations. Amen. I believe that's very important. And so in different countries like Africa, it'd be more a medical center or something like that. But we've got different things planned. Uh, you know, all, all include a ministry unit that has a, that has a church that has a leadership training center, and that's got a humanitarian project. Now, we do the humanitarian project not just to be nice, but we do it because we want to see souls. Amen. Everything that we do is about souls coming into the kingdom of God. So that's a real short version. But, uh, you know, we do a lot of work now around the world. But just this past year, we've been in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Australia. We're going to Fiji. We've been in Zambia. We've been back in Europe again in numerous places. And, yes, we've even been to Maui. Praise the Lord. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> yes, I have to, we have to include that as well. But, you know, uh, God is moving around the world. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And one of the things that we do when we talk to people like such as in Maui, uh, they want to join us, praise the Lord, in the very things that we do. So we're really excited about that. Praise the Lord. If you brought your Bibles with you, I'd like for you to turn with me this morning to the book of Ephesians. 
And we're going to begin reading in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, which is Paul's prayer. If you don't mind, babe, would you mind sending me some water? I could really use some water. And uh, just to let you know, ushers, you know, if my wife jumps up and she comes up on stage and she grabs the, the mic away from me, don't worry about it. That's normal. <laughs> because, you know, we have an... We have a, an, an, you know, how would I call it? You know, it's, it's an unspoken thing, but we have an understanding between one another. If I just give the big picture without filling in the details, then she is allowed to come up anytime and fill you in with some of the details to get you a better picture. Amen. And so every once in a while, uh, Ingrid will jump up and jump up on stage and ask for the mic. And so I will be glad to give the mic to her because I know it's time for you to get some of the details. How many of you know guys usually tend to give you the big picture, you know? Uh, but without the details, you might miss the, miss the whole picture. Amen. So my wife is really good in filling in the blank. So, babe, I give you the the opportunity once again to help me out. Praise the Lord. All right. So the topic I wanted to talk to you this morning is called the, the revelation of authority. And how many of you know we have authority in this life? Amen. Not just authority in the natural world, but uh, specifically we have been granted authority, praise God, in the realm of the Spirit. And to have authority is extremely powerful. When Jesus was raised from the dead, I tell you what, you know, he won such a victory. He just beat the devil on his own turf, in his own dom domain. Amen. He beat the devil. He beat the bully. And when he came up from the dead, he didn't just get back into the tomb and banged on the tomb door or the wall and said, let me out of here. You know, I've just been raised from the dead. No, he came out, right? He came out swinging. He didn't come out with two front teeth missing and his right leg dragging behind him, having come out of a stiff fight with the devil and said, come on, guys, help me out a little bit. Give me a little push. I got to go back to heaven. That's not what he did, is it? No, when he rose from the dead, he came out and he said this, all power, and the word power literally means all authority, all authority has been given unto me, both in heaven and on earth. Now, if he, Jesus, has all authority, how much is left for the devil? If you know your math, it'd be zero. So the devil has no authority. Amen. The only way that he can have any, any leeway in your life, any authority in your life, any, any way in your life is when he is able to trick you into thinking that you have to give up your authority. And then he will use the authority he takes away from you to use it against you. That's, that's how he functions. So as long as you know that you've been given authority because when Jesus rose from the dead uh, and he said, all authority has been given unto me both in heaven and on earth, uh, I want you to know that he did not take that authority with him. He delegated that authority right back to the church because he said, therefore you go. And in my name, you shall cast out devils. In my name, you shall speak with other tongues. In my name, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So what did Jesus do? He, he took the authority away from the devil and then he gave it back to where it belonged to the church. So we are now operating in delegated Authority. Now, authority is very powerful because I'm just thinking about, um, you know, a story that happened to us when, with our family. When my family moved from Holland to Canada back in 1975, it was, it was a long time ago. But this really was vivid, you know. I mean, I didn't want to go at the time. I was a rebel. I was 15. I was a rebel without a cause. So I didn't want to go. But my dad told me I'm supposed to go keep swimming. He said so. But when we, when we left, we, we took a plane. And our plane went from Holland, from Amsterdam.
them to Toronto. And because of all the emotions that were attached, because family members came to the airport to say goodbye to us, and there were tears shed, and there was all kinds of chaos going on. And uh, so when we got to the desk, you know, my parents and six kids, they told my, my dad that the plane had left. It's right there taxiing now on the, the runway, ready to depart. And my dad told him, no, he said, that can't be. He said, because we need to be, my family needs to be on that plane. Well, they said, sorry, sir, but, you know, it's already left. Uh, it's already on the, the, the runway. It's taxiing, ready to depart. My dad said, you know what, you're going to have to do something about it. You know, you may as well call the thing back. Well, she said, that can't happen. That has never been done be before. This is a big airplane on a, at a big airport. Right? That, like, it's not just a little rinky-dink airport out there. This is a big, big airport with a big, big 747 plane. So that has never happened before. So my dad said, and I could tell it in his voice. Now, he doesn't get loud. You know, he does not get more, uh, whatever the word is. He doesn't get rude. He doesn't get more bold. But he got some authority in him. He said, I need to speak to someone else. She said, okay, I'll let you speak to someone else, but it's not going to help you any. So someone else came, told them the same story. It's not possible. But my dad said, I need to be, my family needs to be on this plane. Don't worry, sir, there's another plane going to Montreal this afternoon. My dad said, I don't speak French. <laughs> so he said, I need to be on this plane. And you know what happened? Because of the authority in his voice, they called the plane back. That's a big deal. Isn't it? They called the plane back. So we saw it moving around. It came all the way back and it took a half hour, you know, for it to come back. And when we came on, uh, you know, the people were mad at us. We got all these dirty looks. You know, I thought it was a sign from heaven. We're not supposed to go. But, <laughs> but you know, but the plane came, came back. That had never done. This lady said that had never been done before. So you can do some things when you've got authority. Amen. Now, authority is not expressed in being rude. It's not expressed in being loud. It's just expressed in knowing who you are. Amen. And how many of you know, that's one of the big things we always talk about. If you know who you are in Christ, amen, then you can do things. You can accomplish things. How many of you know the Bible tells us God is good and he does good. Why do you think he does good things? The reason why he does good things is not trying to, he's not trying to impress you. He's not feeling so bad about himself that he says, you know what, I better do something nice, I better do something good for, for me to have a better day, for me to have a good day. No, no, no. <laughs> he does good things. I submit this to you. He does good things because he is good. Amen. Because he is good, he does good things. He can't help himself. Amen. It's who he is. So his actions, the things that he does, have everything to do with who he is. Does that make sense to you? Amen. And if you know who God is, if you really know according to the Bible who he is, then it makes sense to you that the things which he does are always, always above and beyond. <laughs> is that right? Because according to the Bible, he's El Shaddai, not El Chipo. Is that right? He's the God who's more than enough. That's why he does things which are more than enough. That's why your cup runs over. That's who he is. He can't help himself. He can't help that your cup is not big enough. If you want more of him, get yourself a bigger cup. Because he keeps pouring. That's who he is. He can't help that your, that your boat isn't big enough when he gives you a boat sinking load of fish. He can't help that. He can't help that you, your boat is not big enough or your net is not strong enough. Get yourself a better net or get yourself a bigger boat. That's just who he is. He is the God who will always do far above. Amen. He will do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. That's just who he is. So it's the same thing for, for us. If you know who you are, 
then you will act accordingly. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Is that right? This is what the Bible says. So if your thinking is wrong, your actions will be wrong. But if your thinking is right in line with what the Word says, praise God, then it won't be long and your actions will fall in line. So that's why we are strong in our type of churches on knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's why we're strong on the fact that you got to know that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Because when you know that you're the righteousness of God in Christ, guess what? You will do right things. Woo, amen. You'll do right things. You may not immediately do them, <laughs> but over time, as you renew your mind to what the Word says, you will wind up doing right things. Praise the Lord. That's why the Bible tells us, you know, in Christ you've been blessed. <laughs> Amen. You've been blessed in heavenly places. And you've been blessed with Abraham's blessing. So wherever you go, you know, coming in, going out in the city, city in the country, wherever you are, you are a blessed person. So the more that you talk about yourself according to how God has recreated you, the more it will be operating functional in your life. Amen. So it's the same thing with this fact, with your authority. It is based on the fact that you are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. That is just as much an in Christ reality as knowing who you are in Christ that has to do with where you're placed, where you are seated. So the foundational truth is that the authority of the believer is a, 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 a revelation of the place that you hold in the realm of the Spirit. Amen. When Jesus was raised from the dead, you too, you were raised from the dead because of the fact that you are in Christ. In Christ is one of these technical terms that Paul uses. In Christ, through Christ, with Christ. Amen. It's kind of like an, like an elevator, right? If I don't know about you, but you know, I always, I'm the guy that kind of a type of a person. I walk into every open door that I got, right? So I've, many times I've gone to the hospital uh, in order to visit people, and the, the, the elevator door is open. Now, I don't bother to check if it's going down or if it's going up. Usually, I have to go to the third level of the hospital to visit people, but because I don't look where I'm going, I walk right into the open door, because it's an open door. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and many times, I have wound up in the parking lot down, down on P2. Because that's where the elevator took me. And it takes me a little while to finally get to number three. Well, that's what it is like to be in Christ. Wherever the elevator goes, you go. Wherever Christ has been, you have been. That's awesome, isn't it? He went to the lowest, lowest hell. Amen. That's where you went. Now, thank God you didn't have to experience it, but in Christ... That's where you've gone. That's where you have went. That's how God views it. Amen. When then he was raised from the dead, praise the Lord, uh, or he, he was made alive, then he was raised up from the dead, and then he was seated in heavenly places on the right hand of God the Father. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So many people saying, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You got to go by the cross. Don't get me wrong. You got to die, right? Just like Jesus did in Christ. That's what happened to you. In Christ, you were buried. Some people will say, you know, well, I got to take that with me to the grave. I got good news for you. It's been done. <laughs> you've, you've taken it to the, to the grave. Not only that, but past the cross, you want to follow Jesus in his resurrection as well. Not only that, you want to follow him all the way to the place where he is now seated on the right hand of God the Father, which is a place of authority. And like we say, you know, Ingrid and I, we always say this, you know, where you are seated has a lot to do with how you are treated. Amen. Now, if you don't believe that, you know, just follow us. We, the odd time, you know, we get upgraded. We get bumped to first class when we fly, 
right? You know, we, we get an economy seat, but the first time, I remember when it happened, they told us, you know, we're going to bump you up uh, to first class. I thought, well, that sounds good. You know, didn't know exactly what it meant, but I found out very quickly that it is a promotion. <laughs> Amen. That you get the seat up front. And, uh, you know, they don't wait for everybody to be seated. They don't even wait till you're at cruising altitude. They come right to you immediately when you're sitting down with a bowl, with a, with a bowl of these warm walnuts. They warm them up for you. Amen. You get a glass of orange juice. They know you by name. Mr. Housing, would you like a menu? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Never thought about it, but sure, I'll have a menu. And, uh, you know, it was so good, right? Because it's not just chicken or beef. You have a menu <laughs> with filet mignon is on there. And there's a whole lot of choices on there. I felt like ordering page one because it just looks so good. <laughs> Amen. And so I ordered what I had and, you know, I got it in no time. It went really, really quick. And then they, you see all these peasants walk by you. Right? <laughs> They're all walking by you. They go to the back where you bought your ticket. You're supposed to be there, but because of favor, you were bumped up. So no, you're no longer part of the peasants, right? And they make sure that you're not part of them because they close that little blue curtain behind you. So that once it's closed, praise the Lord, they're over there and you're here in f first class, praise the Lord. Now, when you're going down real fast, that would not really bother anybody anymore, right? When you crash the plane, nothing matters, you know, in that case. But while you're flying, praise the Lord, that's a big deal that they close these two curtains because now there's a separation between you and the peasants. Now, I... First, I felt guilty, right? But I thought, well, no, I mean, I'm, you know, I didn't ask for this. It was given to me. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So I got used to it real quick. As a matter of fact, one of these peasants back there tried to get through the blue curtains and use our bathroom. So I wanted to trip him. And so, <laughs> so who do you think you are? Get back where you belong. Now, I didn't do that, of course. It's just a joke. But... <laughs> All I'm saying with that is, you know, where you are seated has a lot to do with how you are treated. Now, praise the Lord. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Amen. Far above all principality Ooh, and power and might dominion. I tell you what, you have a seat for the elite. That's where you are seated, right on the right hand of God the Father, right next to your master and savior, Jesus Christ. You didn't pay for the seat. He paid for that seat. It's a place of rest. But more than anything, it's a place of authority. All right. Does that make sense to you? So with that in mind, would you mind if we just read this? For uh, Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to read a few scriptures. I hope you don't mind that. We're in church, so it should be okay. <laughs> And we're going to begin reading in verse 15. And really this is Paul praying for the church in Ephesus. And he wants them to uh, acquire something. Let's find out. Wherefore, he says, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And this is what he's praying. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The, the phrase in the knowledge of him literally means for the acknowledgement of him. So if you have the spirit of wisdom and, and uh, uh, re revelation, it should get you to acknowledge Jesus in everything that you do. Now, isn't that what? Philemon tells you to do, that the, uh, that the sharing or the, the, the communication of your faith may become effectual by you acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So really what Paul is saying is if you want your faith to become effective, you're going to have to talk about, acknowledge every good thing that's in you in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? So that's why you talk about who you are in Christ. You sing about who you are in Christ because that's how you're going to act. 
Right here he prays that you get the spirit of wisdom and, and, and revelation. So you can acknowledge those things in your life. So he goes on to say, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding or your spirit being enlightened, being flooded with light. How many of you know you have eyes in your spirit, in your understanding as much as you've got eyes in your head, right? What do you do with your eyes? Well, the eyes let in the light. You don't really see with your eyes, but the eyes let in the light, and you see with your brain, actually. But how many of you know your eyes are very important? Because uh, the amount of light that it lets in, that's how well or how not well you're able to see. So it would be the truth for, this, for the realm of the spirit, right? Because you see with your heart. Have you ever said it? Oh, I see it. Right? I see it. Right? Well, what are you saying? Well, there was a time you didn't see it. But now, you know, you can't always put your finger on it. But you see it. That's spiritual understanding. Amen. Have you ever said those words? I can't put my finger on it, but I do see it. Right? Does it help you? <laughs> Amen. All right. So the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. How many of you know you can know what is the hope of your calling? If you know that, it will get you up on Monday morning without a problem. It is a motivating, it's a dr driving force in your life. The hope of your calling. And that, there's a whole other story. What is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? I mean, you know, God has made you rich. He has invested his riches inside of you. Amen. Amen. And if you took it serious, whoo, I tell you what, you would never see yourself as a poor person ever again. Amen. You've been made rich. Amen. And it's not just... Uh, not just financial riches, although financial riches would be included in that as well. It's all kinds of riches. But God has made you a very rich person. Amen. Amen. So you got to quit talking about how poor you are and how broke you are. You know, and how much of a curse there's abiding around you. <laughs> you know, let's keep talking about how rich you have been made in Christ Jesus. I got abundance wherever I go. That's really what riches mean. You've got a supernatural abundance of, there's a flow, there's a grace that goes with it. Amen. Amen. How many of you know God is not against money? Right? He's against people that hoard money. Right? Once you begin to hoard it, that's where the problem is. But as long as you are giving, praise God, he'll, you know, if one, one person said it this way, if God can get it through you, he'll get it to you. Yeah. Amen. So that's another story as well. But this is where we really want to focus in on verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Who? That's what he wants you to know. He wants you to know, not just head knowledge, but really get to know this. How great is his power towards you who believe? How many believers do we have in the house today? Well, so God wants you to know how much power there is towards you. It's not against you. It's towards you. Amen. See, we, all, we think that God is against us. He's not. He's towards you. He's for you. Amen. Now, to give you an idea of what it's like, he, he says what it is like. It is, it is uh, according to a measure. Uh, he said, it is according to the working, in verse 19, of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And then he goes on to talk about a reference of where it is, how far it is, far, far above all principality. It'd be something just to be above it all, but he, he says he's far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in the age which is now, but also in the age which is to come. How many of you know there's some ages which are to come? We're living in the last of the last days, the last of the days of the church age. It doesn't mean that the church is going to uh, no longer e exist. It just means we're going to move to a different place from here to heaven. We're going to do some kingdom business from heaven. 
Amen. And then we're going to come back to the earth again during the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. We're going to show the devil who's boss. <laughs> Amen. Going to kick him out. And it's the church is going to rule and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. And the, the world will know what it is like. Because that's the man that we're looking for. That's the man with authority. Jesus is the man with authority. He knows how. Now the devil rules and reigns right now, you know, with some power. But he's stolen the authority. And he still uses uh, uses that thing. He, he, he lies to government. He lies to people. And that's the way that he gets back in, in power. But you and I, we've been given, given the authority to cast him out. Amen. Remember what Jesus said, the first thing he ever said about the church. And how many of you know, if you're in Bible school, you should know this, that it's the law of the first mention. When something is mentioned for the first time, it's going to be the foundational doctrine and teaching for everything else. The first time that Jesus ever used the word church was when he said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. Now that's a loaded statement. Did you know that? Because, first of all, that tells me Jesus is doing something. He's building something. What do you think he's been doing for the last 2,000 years? Some people think he's been playing ping pong with the Father. <laughs> or maybe he's been taking a, taking a rest. You know, I mean, that, that, that resurrection experience, I tell you what, that took, that took a lot out of me. I'm going to take a rest for the next 2,000 years. Well, no, that's not who he is. He's building the church. Amen. He's building the church. I don't know about you, but I don't have enough. I don't have more sense than to build with him. Amen. I'm going to build with him. I'm going to get my hammer or whatever it takes, praise the Lord, to help him build what he's been building. And I tell you what, when you take on that attitude, you get great favor. Woo. <laughs> Amen. You may not be perfect, but if you take on, if you take on the interest that he has, and he's interested in building the church. Praise God. If you take on the same interest, you can't help but get favor on you. Amen. Praise the Lord. But not, not only that, he said this, and against, against the church, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Against the church, the gates of hell. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been attacked by a gate? The answer would be no. Well, why would that be? Well, a gate is not an offensive mechanism. It's a defensive mechanism. So what does it tell me? It's we're on the, the church is on the attack. And it's the devil who's on the defense. Now, that should change your mindset. Because I hear a lot of people talk, oh, I wonder what God is going to do next. Right? Because they see what the devil is doing. It looks like, you know, people are going to hell in a handbasket. What is God going to do to counteract that? Guess what? Nothing. He's done everything he's ever going to do about the devil. There's nothing that the devil has in his quiver that he is able to overcome the church at any time. As soon as we pick up what God has given us. Amen. Including our authority. Then I tell you what. Then the devil is a defeated foe. Amen. Amen. Not someone you have to worry about. Now he likes to, to make it sound like he's real someone. Right? Like he likes to come in. He likes to you know, over, overpower you with the things that he says. But when it's all said and done. He is a zero. He went from hero to zero. <laughs> Amen. He used to be the anointed cherub that covers. You know, he used to be the hero, but after he did what he did, he went from hero to zero. And you've been given authority in the name of Jesus to cast him out of your life, to cast him out of your family affairs, to cast him out of your business affairs. To cast him out of your church affairs, meaning that you've been granted to take authority over him. Now, last, last year I was in the country of uh, Slo Slovakia, in the city of Zelina. That's what the city's name. was in the church, and as I walked in, I walked, you know, past some people, and, uh, and my eyes, you know, caught eyes with someone else. You know, he was a gypsy man. 
And I could tell on his eyes there's something wrong with him, but, you know, I'm not there to figure that one out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there to preach the gospel. So I did, and uh, I gave an altar call for people to become born again. So a good number of people came up, and uh, he came up as well. So I thought, praise the Lord, he, won. he needs to get born again. But then he began to talk to my interpreter. And he began to say some things I wasn't able to make any sense out of it. But then my interpreter told me that he came up because he wants to, he wants the devil cast out of him. I said, well, you know, just stand over here for a little bit. I said, because I want to do what I'm supposed to do first. You know, I want to lead people to the Lord. So I had the privilege of leading all these people to the Lord. And then it dawned on me, okay, I got to talk to this gentleman over here now. So I, I turned myself to him. And as I did, the Holy Ghost whoo, rose up on the inside of me real big. And authority rose up on the inside of me real big. I pointed at him and said, I said, in the name of Jesus, you come out of her. Or him, I said, she said, you come out of him. You come out of him. So he fell down. And uh, then he got back up and he started talking to me in perfect North American English. And I told him to shut up in Jesus' name and, you know, go back and come out. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure exactly what happened because I, I don't want to pay attention to that. I don't want the congregation to pay attention to what's going on over here for a very long time either. So we just moved over. Uh, and did some other things, you know, some other people came forward to be filled with the Holy Ghost, so we did that, and after about five or ten minutes, you know, he stood up, and you, I could tell a difference in his eyes right there, and now he wanted to get saved and be filled with the Holy Spirit, so we had the privilege of leading him to Jesus, he got filled with the Holy Spirit, and then afterwards, I'm thinking, okay, now I want to know, because I, I wasn't, I didn't think he was able to speak in English, but sometimes you don't always know that. So I walked up to him. I said something in English. He didn't understand a word I said. And, uh, you know, the only word, the only sentence he could say was, thank you, in a Slavic accent. So he didn't speak English whatsoever. So, so there was the devil in him that wanted to argue and speak perfect English with me. But thank God, we've got authority. Amen. You and I have been given authority over all the works of of the enemy. So it's not just Jesus. It's not just the Apostle Paul. Amen. It's you and I. But again, it's got to do with knowing who you are, knowing where you're seated. You remember the seven sons of Sceva? They also wanted to cast out the devil. And they said, you know, we cast you out. We adjure you to come out of him uh, in, the in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. So they didn't really know their authority. So what did the devil say? Paul I know. Jesus I know. Who are you? So you better know who, who you are. Otherwise you're going to get into trouble. So the devil, you know, overtook them. You know, one guy overtook seven other guys because he was filled with the devil. And he tore all their clothes off. So you got seven naked guys running down the street because of one, one man who had an evil spirit. So you don't want that in your ministry. <laughs> Amen. You want to know who you are in Christ, what you can do in Christ, and most of all, praise God, where you are seated in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only that, verse 22, and he, Jesus, or God actually, has put all things under his feet. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You might say, well, that's good, Jesus. That's really nice for you. Yea, Jesus. But let's keep reading. Verse 2 or chapter 2, verse 1. And you has he quickened. Meaning, and you has he made alive. At the same time when Jesus was made alive, you were made alive at the same time. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Who were, that it goes to talk about who you used to be. You were dead in trespasses and sin. The word dead and death in the New Testament usually means spiritual death, right? It doesn't necessarily mean physical death, but you are disconnected in, you know, uh, when you were dead in sin, it really meant you were connected to sin, but disconnected from God. But now in Christ, you've been, you're dead to sin means you've been disconnected from it. Right? Have you ever had that happen to you? On your phone, you became disconnected? Well, 
uh, you can't talk anymore with that, with that person. And you've been made alive in Christ. You're alive unto God. With other words, a new connection who has been established. That's who you are. You're one with him. So one, you can't tell the difference. And you, you hear people talk. I don't know, but something told me. Really, it's someone told you. Right? I don't know, I don't know if it's me or the Holy Ghost. Because it's sometimes difficult to tell. Because you're so close. Amen. He's so close to you that you don't always know if it's you or if it's him. Well, it's usually a combination. Amen. All right. Where in time? Man, you, know, you were dead in trespasses and sins. In time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is operating in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. In time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Yeah, yeah, Paul, we know that by now. <laughs> but God, he says... Woo, everything changes, but God. See, this is how it used to be, but not anymore. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you're saved. How many of you know can talk about amazing grace, right? <laughs> Amen. Amazing grace. Not only that, but he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where you are. You didn't buy that seat, like I said. It was purchased for you. Amen. It was purchased for you. Having a seat also means this, that... Uh, you know, you no longer have to work for anything. When you're sitting down, it means the work's been done. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You're not paying anything off. You're not trying to pay for your salvation. You're not trying to pay for your reservation. It's been paid for in Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show you the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. How many of you know? We're in for some good days. Yeah. Amen. We're in for some good days. God has already uh, be begun to show his kindness to you by saving us. And saving does not just mean that you get a new start in life. It does not mean that God just pressed a reset button. When you are saved, it means you have been recreated in a yeah. new, altogether new type of being. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. In the same way that Jesus is not the old, he's a new creation. In that self same way, you too have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have become the righteousness of God in Christ. What does that mean? Well, it means this, that when you stand before God uh, or yeah, before his, when you come into the throne room of grace, you don't have to come in begging or squalling or trying to talk God into doing some, something for you. You belong there. You've got authority to be there. That's why you can come with boldness. Amen. Amen. You don't come in there whimpering and whining. You come in there with boldness and you make your statement. You say, Lord, this is what you said. This is what you said. I'm going to hold you to it. Amen. One of the reasons that, you know, God canceled your sin, the Bible says, Isaiah 43, he said, I, even I, am he who, 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 who forgives all of your transgressions. He said he did it for his sake, for my sake, he said. I thought it was for my sake, for our sake. But the Bible says that he did it for his sake as well. Why would that be? Well, if you keep reading that, it's because he needed a voice of authority on this earth. Amen. When you speak, heaven listens. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Can you see that heaven responds to what you do? 
Heaven responds to what you do. Can I give you a quick little story about, you know, my spiritual father, our spiritual father, Brother Hagen? You know, he told us the story, uh, you know, how he saw, he saw Jesus in a, in a, in a vision. I'm going to quickly do this for you. You know, he saw Jesus in a vision. While Jesus is talking, he, he's giving him some vital in, information for his ministry. How many of you know that would be important? That would be kind of nice to know. While Jesus is talking, this little demon comes in. He jumps up and down. He's making a racket and a black screen, you know, clouds Jesus. He can still see Jesus a little bit, but he's kind of clouded. But he can't hear him say anything anymore. He's still talking, but this demon is making so much noise that he is... You know, he can't really hear what Jesus is saying. So he's waiting for Jesus to do something. Right? And he's waiting and he's waiting and nothing is going on. Jesus keeps talking, but he can't hear it. So out of frustration, he pointed at this devil. He said, get out of here in Jesus' name. He said, I don't want to, but I will have to if you tell me to. I said, I tell you to. You know, get, get out of here. So he left the uh, screen or the, the, the smoke screen left. He could hear Jesus talk again. Now, Jesus knows what he's thinking. Right? And he tells, he tells Brother Hagen in this vision, he said, if you didn't do anything about the devil, I could not have done anything about him. And that really, Brother, H Brother Hagen was really bothered by that statement. He said, you know, Lord, am I hearing you right? Because uh, I, can, I can appreciate if you said that if you, you wouldn't do anything about it. But you're saying you could not do anything about him? He said, yeah. He said, if you wouldn't have dealt with the devil, he said, I could not have. So Brother Hagen made this statement. He said, well, Lord, even though I'm seeing you in a, in a, in a vision, I've never heard anything like this. I've never read this in the Bible. <laughs> you know, I don't know anything about it. You're going to have to give me two or three scriptures to back up. Otherwise, I cannot uh, ac accept this vision or anything else that you're saying. Now, do you think that Jesus got mad at him for saying that? Well, no. Because you know why? Because if you're of the truth, you want to be tested. Right? The Bible tells us to test every spirit. Well, uh, people who become defensive, spirits that become defensive are, are, not, are not of the truth. Because if you're of the truth, you welcome being tested. Go ahead, test me. So Jesus gave him a big smile. He said, I'm not going to give you two or three. He said, I'm going to give you four. I'm going to give you four scriptures that will tell you that you are supposed to do something about the devil. Amen. You are supposed to cast him out. Amen. You're supposed to take authority over him. You know, don't give place, neither give place to the devil. Guess what? You're in charge. Amen. You don't have to run to a pastor. You can if you want to, but you don't need to run to a pastor. You don't need to phone a 1-800 number. You know, to help you out. You can if you want to. It's fine with you to agree with someone. But the main thing that you need to know for yourself, you have been given authority in the name of Jesus. It's that name that carries not only the authority, but the power to deal with demons, with dark influence, with sickness and disease, with everything that's coming against you. Amen. Let's all stand up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I don't know every person here, but I want to, first of all, give you an invitation this morning that if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know, you may have heard about him, you may have been in church, but just being in church does not necessarily change anything in your life. It, things begin to change when you receive him as your Savior and as your Lord. So that you know for yourself that I'm a child of God. I'm on my way to heaven. If you don't know that this morning, I'm going to ask you to boldly raise your hand indicating to me, please pray for me. I want to know that I know that I know that I'm a child of God, that my eternity has been taken care of. If you don't know that, please raise your hand if that's you. Just want to make real sure that everyone has the opportunity to receive Jesus. Or perhaps you're here. And you would say, well, I do know Jesus, uh, but I've been, I'm, I'm out of fellowship with him. I need to come back to the Lord. This is for you as well. Or perhaps you're here and you would say, I'm in fellowship with the Lord. I know him. I've been born again. But I've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, as the book of Acts tells us. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us that, or 
Acts chapter 2 verse 4, sorry, tells us they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If that has never happened to you and you would like that to happen to you this morning, again, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand indicating to me, please pray for me. I want that. I need that in my life. Can I see your hand? There's anyone here? Anyone here this morning? Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Oh, just begin to worship Him for a moment. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. So tamamare di stevaro storuno, e mamare di ingasto su valateri, su marane di daranombro. Oh, na mama mara vestere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Just go ahead and praise Him. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it, He says. He'll fill it with new languages. He'll fill it with good things. He'll fill it with blessing, not cursing. He'll fill your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Se levantou soro no mamaladere, bruto singara na macevro, sore yarnan jura tu macere, amor tu louvra matere testerere, susu maranere. I would remind you to stir up the gift, rekindle the flame, fanning the fire, the fire that's burning deep in your heart to set you apart for God's glory. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power and love, power and love, soundness of mind in all that we do, that He may be glorified in me and in you. We've got the power. God-given power abiding within you that raises the dead. We've got the power. God-given power to come through each crisis ahead. Ooh, yes, amen. Do you believe that? It's in you, amen. <laughs> it's in you. Praise the Lord. Say it with me. Raise one hand to heaven. Say it with me. I believe in God the Father, in His Son, Jesus Christ, in the mighty Holy Spirit, who fills me with revelation so that I may know who I am, what I can do, where I'm seated, in heavenly places, far above, all principality and power and might and every name that is named in Jesus name amen and amen amen praise the Lord hallelujah amen God bless you pastor awesome thank you pastor John that was awesome Did you all learn something today got your authority Awesome. Hey, I want to thank you guys for joining us this morning. As always, you guys are a blessing. Enjoy another fabulous week. Blessed to the full till it overflows. You have it? You guys truly believe it? Blessed to the full? Yes? Awesome. I like it. All right, you guys are blessing. Thank you for joining us. 
Lord, just as we, we close here, Lord, I just want to thank you for everything you've done and everything they're doing, Lord. Lord, I just want to thank you that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, the great I am. That you are our Father. And Lord, I want to thank you that everything we put our hand to towards is a success, Lord. That we are the head, not the tail. That we are above and never again to be beneath, Lord. We want to thank you for the authority that you have given us. That we have authority over every situation, circumstance, devil, demon, it don't matter. Your name is above all names. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that these people are blessed this week. That they're blessed coming in, blessed going out. They're blessed in the country. They're blessed in the city. They're blessed. Everything they put their hands to is blessed, Lord. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.